generally speaking, no matter how good our marketing is on our websites or our offerings, anything like that, people still have questions. And so if I open the door for them to ask more questions, I can start to pinpoint what is the holdup for them taking action. I can address that objection and then close them on the deal later on. Hey folks, welcome to another Wealth Wednesday webinar. So I am kind of, I'm doing webinar duty today simply because uh, Chris and the rest of the team are traveling. Um, but so we decided this week was a really great week to bring on somebody we've known forever, um, Bob McIntosh. He's going to talk to you today about marketing. He is kind of our marketing guru and uh, has an absolutely amazing wealth of knowledge on all of this and has uh, really been quite successful in the social space as well. So Bob, without any more further ado or me talking, I'm going to hand it off to you. Beautiful. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks so much for being on. And uh, I don't know if Chris actually watches the recordings of these or not, but if it does, thanks, Chris, for having me here. And uh, to everyone else, appreciate you guys taking the time to be here. Um, I've got quite a bit of content to go through, so make sure that you've got a pen, paper, notes, all that stuff um, ready to go. Before we get started, what I would love to know is for everyone attending in, um, type in the chat for me what business you're in. Because um, today's uh, topic, what we're going to talk about is really how do you turn your marketing into more deals, whether it be more sales if you're an e-commerce person, more traffic if you're a local business, more um, service offerings if you're a service business, or I know a lot of you guys are real estate investors. If you're a real estate investor, how do we actually close more you know, real estate? But if you need, uh, but I would love to know from everyone here, just kind of what business you're in, because I can kind of tailor this a little bit to fit um, what all of you guys have. So feel free to um, drop in and just let me know in the chat. First and foremost, who the heck am I? Again, my name is Bob McIntosh and um, I've known Chris for a number of years. We actually grew up in the same hometown. Um, so, you know, rubbed elbows a little bit there for, for a while and then um, was there for his uh, TV show and helping build Flip Out Academy. And that's actually also where I met Andrew and uh, my dad and I, who's pictured there in the in the bathrobe. Um, and the reason I chose that is because that's the first time I think he said he ever wore a bathrobe for a massage. So had to get a picture of that. Um, that's my dad. We run Arcane Properties, which is a real estate investing business based out of Buffalo. Uh, and then I also have a business I'm a co-founder of called Three Degrees Consulting, which does digital marketing. And I got very good at digital marketing marketing over the course of the last 12, 13 years of doing it, kind of seeing the comings and goings of what digital marketing can do, what it was for a while, what it uh, kind of fell off to and is rising back up to with, with COVID. So it's been an interesting ride in that space. But as I've gone along and, and done this, the thing that I found the most is that I love what digital marketing has the capability of doing for any business. Again, whether you're um, you know, in insurance, whether you're in a service-based uh, business or anything. Uh, and actually, I see Jesse wrote, he's a boat charter business on Lake Travis in Austin. It's awesome. I actually lived on Lake Travis for a year. I just left there in March of this year, but I was uh, uh, right there, right near Sundancer Grill. I'm assuming you probably know where that is, depending on where you're at in, in the area. But digital marketing has a massive opportunity for us, no matter what business we're in. And, uh, and the opportunity has only increased as COVID has come along. And our ability to use the internet to drive more sales, uh, drive more deals, drive more everything in our business is going to be massive. So as we go along and we do um, whatever it is that we're doing on a normal basis, we also have a huge opportunity to build more follow-up systems and things of that nature into our business to help us um, make what that needs to be. So without any further ado, again, grab paper, grab pen, or get a notepad open on your, uh, on your computer, because we're going to go through a lot of tactics. We're going to go through a lot of strategy of things that you need to be doing and how you can um, really grow your business pretty dramatically to generate more wealth as you go along in whatever it is. Now, um, one thing I, I will cover too is that if you're just getting started in business, hey, you're just getting getting going, um, then this is even better because if you can build these systems out now, they're going to work for you as you go along. And if you've already been doing it for a while, and that's okay too. Um, you can certainly implement them at any point in time. And since you have existing customers, you simply plug in what, you are, what you're already doing um, with some of these new systems and you're gonna see a dramatic increase. And I'm gonna share with you some of the examples as we go along with this. Um, but specifically, I wanna talk about why your web presence is critical. I don't care what business you're on, you need to have a solid web presence. Um, it's one of the most important things to generating um, better leads, especially from a digital standpoint. And the newer that you are, the more important it becomes to have a great, web presence. 
The next thing on here is going to be how to market, uh, how text marketing can help you 10 X your conversions. Um, literally text marketing is one of the most important abilities that we have right now to generate not only more leads, but more communication with our leads, which ultimately leads to more sales, which ultimately leads to building a better business and driving in more of what we do. Next is how you can get a 46 X ROI using email. I know it sounds crazy, but uh, if, if I offered you the ability to trade $1 for 46, I'm going to go on a limb here and say, most of you would probably say, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Why not? Right. And that's where we're going to cover the most important follow-up sequences that every business needs to have uh, and how conversation marketing is really drastically changing the results of what we do. So that's what we're going to cover. I know it may sound like, hey, this is maybe simple stuff, but I'm going to tell you right now, the thing that I've learned in my time is that the simple things that are often the most monotonous, if done in volume, will actually increase your overall business dramatically. And if we don't focus on that volume with the monotonous things, um, oftentimes we get the, the shiny object syndrome, which I, I understand most of us uh, experience that at some point in time. When that happens, we actually lose out on a potential of having a lot more business. Um, I noticed that there's a bunch more more folks that have uh, rolled in since I started. If you're just joining us right now, um, I'd love to for you to use the Q&A box to just drop in um, what business you're in. Because as I go through this, I'm going to try to use examples that are going to be the most relevant to those of you who participate and actually drop in and go with that. So I'd love to know again, what business you're in just in the Q&A box, just, just drop that in for me and uh, we'll go from there. In order to be successful at business, in order to really generate more wealth and build whatever it is that you want to build, we need to have lots of marketing. You know, I know a lot of you guys are real estate investors. Um, so a lot of this specifically talks to real estate, but at the end of the day, um, some of this marketing it still works, whether you're a local business, whether you're a service-based business, um, whether you're doing real estate or anything else of that nature, right? The end of the, uh, the end point here is that we got to have lots of marketing. Um, if we think about our business, we think about trying to build what it is. Oftentimes people mistake the amount of volume it's going to take to be successful, right? Um, and, I, and I think about, uh, there's, there's a, a, a guy that's a mentor of mine online called Alex Hormozzi. And I don't know if you've heard this guy or not, but very successful business owner, runs a portfolio of companies right now doing, I believe he said somewhere around $84 million a year in total. So pretty successful guy when it comes to business and, and that, right? And one of the things I love is a great story that he shares. And that's when he ran his first business, which is a, a gym, a local gym, someone told him to do flyers and he passed out like 300 flyers. And like one guy called him and told him he messed up his car and didn't get any business out of it. And he told his mentor, hey, I did flyers, didn't work. I, you know, it just, this is not a legitimate thing to do. His mentor was like, uh, well, you know, 300 is, is nothing, right? We do, we do 5,000 flyers as a test just to see what's going on. And then we send out 5,000 a day after we figure out which test, uh, you know, flyer worked the best. And I love this story because it helps us understand that volume is critical. And if we want to be successful in anything that we're doing from a business venture, oftentimes we can literally 10X the current volume that we're doing of anything and we'll see more results. Because if we put out more, we have more at-bats and more at-bats means more wins. Here's the thing that I found. If we take all of those different marketing, and by the way, include any marketing, right? This is this is universal across any marketing, again, in any niche, any, any service offering, any local business, take all that marketing. And the one, there's one singular thing that I found to be true of all marketing I've ever seen done for my clients, participated in, and even the marketing that I've been subject to, and which means, Hey, people marketing to me about their services and business, everything points back to your website right? Everyone wants to know, okay, great. I see your marketing and I understand who you are. The first thing that they're going to do is go back and they're going to check out your website. They're going to want to say, who are you? What is it that you do? How do I know that I can trust you? And can you either solve my problem, answer my question, help me achieve my goal or whatever it's going to be, right? And so if I don't understand that simple fact, then I'm already losing business every single day. Right. And we'll dive into the web presence even more here because there's a lot of other factors that are important to it. But again, every piece of marketing, and I don't care if they, they clicked on an ad or whatever, they're going to go there. And even if they give you their information, right? So now you have a lead in the door and um, you're going to call them or talk to them, or they're going to set up an appointment to come by and see your, you know, visit your local store, or whatever it's going to be. Right. If you do any of that, the next thing that they do after they give you their information is go check out your site. So I'd, you know, if, if you're someone who sets up appointments, for example, and you're seeing a low show, right, one of the biggest reasons could be a lack of a great website, 
because they're going there and they're not understanding that you have the level of credibility that you have or that you're going to work for them or um, let's see, I see. Campbell wrote that he's an in insurance sales, right? Let's be real. Insurance sales can be a tough business because you're not the only insurance salesperson in your area. There's hundreds, if not thousands of other people who offer comparable plans and comparable insurance. So the difference between you and them is oftentimes starting at how much do you put out there on the web for them to di for you to differentiate from everybody else in a competitive space. And by the way, this is true for any business, but what I want you to understand is, Hey, how do we make this stuff work? How do we utilize all of this so that we can build at the end of the day, a better plan, right? For people to find us and increase our credibility as we go along. All right. So the next thing after they check out your website or lack thereof, if you don't have one, is they're going to go to your social media. They're going to check out what are you posting online? Now, Usually the first thing that I hear whenever I talk about social media is usually a collective, right? Because for a lot of us, that's kind of how it feels on social media. Even though we know we need to be there, we know we can generate business there, we know it's going to work for us. There's still kind of this annoyance of having to do it. On the screen here, I've put up um, most of the major social networks that you really need to be focused on and participating in. Now, when I say participating in, here's what I mean. I don't mean that you have to be posting content to all of these all of the time, right? For all of us, we're going to find that we participate in certain networks at a deeper level and other networks, not quite so much. Um, so for me, for example, you're going to see me more on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok more than you're going to see me on LinkedIn, Pinterest, or Snapchat, right? And that's okay. I don't need you as a business owner to go in and be participating and spending all of your time on social media, because for most of us, we simply don't have the time to do that right now until we can hire someone to help us out. But the most important thing that you can do is claim your stake for all of these platforms. And what I mean by that is this, think about social networking and social networks rather as Think about them as, you know, the, the great land rush in Oregon back in the day, you know, where they made the whole Oregon Trail, right? The whole reason all that happened was because you could go out there, get a stake, stick it in the ground, and boom, the ground was yours. You own that land. Um, you just had to get yourself there. Well, social media and all these new networks, in which, by the way, these are the major ones right now, but in the next 24 months, there are at least eight others that I know of for a fact that are launching um, as well that are worth being on. And when I say worth being on, I mean, go out there, stake the claim, get your username or handle or however they're going to call it in that space, grab that, right? So if you go to any of these platforms, you're going to find me at the T-H-E Bob McIntosh. Okay. And even if I'm not participating on all of these, all of these platforms in the same way at the same time, all the time, what I am doing is I am saying, okay, how and what can I do? Um, how and what can I do to claim my space? And now once I have my space claimed and I've got a great website, which we just talked about how important that is. The next thing that I do is I link to my website on all of the social platforms. And this is one of the most important things you can do. It sounds simple, but it is. And here's why. Because no matter what platform, even if you're not actively participating in that platform, if somebody else who's a potential customer from you is participating in that platform and they look you up, at least, at the very least, they're going to see you have an account and they can find and go back to your website or your other social media profiles that you do do um, more content on. And they can drive from there and say, okay, look, here's a great way for me to get found on this platform instead and point them back to my website. Now, it's also okay if you use a link on that profile that is a link to other links. So for example, if you use Linktree or what else, there's Tap CC, uh, there's a bunch of them, right? Right. You know, where basically I can go in, I can, I can include a link that has multiple links to different things. Um, that's okay too. But the most important thing is let people know where it is that you um, can be found any information back to your website. So long as you have a great website, you're actually utilizing the best capacity on every platform to point them back to everywhere that you're doing. Look, even if you're not posting across all platforms, that's okay. And there's, by the way, there's lots of tools that will help you post. Um, Jesse actually just talked to one for one about called Hero Post that helps you um, put content out there. And look, there's absolutely um, things like Hootsuite, Buffer, Hero Post, um, uh, Jarva, I think is one, or maybe it's something else. Um, I could be thinking of a different one, but there's a lot of tools out there. Um, the one thing I will say about this is that understand that at 
any point in time when you're posting to these platforms, make sure that you post content that makes sense in the platform, right? So you're not going to be able to cross post a post from Facebook into TikTok, right? Or an Instagram post into TikTok um, because those posts aren't designed that way. But you could take a reel and post it into TikTok or a TikTok and post it into a reel. Right. Understand that context of the platform does make a big difference as you do that. But look, at the end of the day, even if you're like, Bob, I don't want to be on those social media networks. I don't care. At the very least, as soon as you hear about one, log in, create an account, stake your claim, own your handle, try to make your handles as similar as possible. Again, the, if it's the same one on all of them, it just that's that much better. But at the end of the day, owning that space is going to be um, huge. It's going to say, hey, um, I now have that. And what this all does, guys, is simply this. It helps build trust. Because if we're going out, we're doing marketing online, and we're trying to help people understand who we are, what we do, and how we do it, at the end of the day, we're trying to build a trust factor with someone who doesn't know anything about us, right? And a lot of times when they're finding us, even if it's through a referral, there's still a sense of distrust because we don't know anything about this business um, or they're offering or what they're doing. And so the higher your price point, the more trust that we have to build before they'll take action. So understanding that having a great website is going to be a critical component and have that website tied into your social is huge. Now, you might be saying, okay, Bob, I understand. I get it. I see what you're saying, you know, all of that, but just to hammer it home a little bit more, here's some interesting stats. And the reason that I share these is because I don't care what business you're in right now. If you're not doing this stuff, you're missing out dramatically. And here's the stats um, from 2021, 93% of people, 93%. All right. We'll search the web before making a buying decision. Okay. Which means a, if you're not being found, all right. If you're not being found, you're already losing out. B, if your website is uh, bad design, you're losing out on even more. Because you see right here, 94% of people base their impression of a business on the web design alone, which means, hey, so even if you have a site, that's great. But if it's an out of date, it's very dated looking. It's a very old style. It's old pictures. Um, you know, you've got information that's not relevant anymore on your site, all of these things, if it looks and feels old, they're already judging your business. You could literally be the best person at what you offer, whether it be real estate, insurance sales, boat charters, a health and wellness business, doesn't matter what it is. If your site is outdated, right, from a design standpoint, you're already being judged as a lesser business than anybody else. And 75% will judge the credibility of a business from that. 75% will judge the credibility, which means if you have a data design, even if you've been in business for 50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years even, right? Um, if you have a bad website, they're judging your business based on that and, and that alone because it speaks volumes, right? If you can't even be bothered to have a good-looking website, how are you going to be bothered to take care of my needs as a, co a potential customer for your business? 40% will actually leave a site if the loading time is longer than three seconds, so if you've been going on websites lately, and this is a, an, an interesting thing, right? And noticing that they're getting longer and longer and longer, for example, right? So there's more and more content on one page. You can just kind of keep scrolling through and scrolling through and scrolling through if you're on your phone or, you know, using your mouse wheel or, you know, the if you've got your laptop and the fingers. At the end of the day, the reason for that is because if it takes longer than three seconds, people are going to leave. And so what um, business owners have realized is that, well, if it's that's the case, then I'm going to try to get the initial like one or two scrolls of content to load up as quickly as possible, which is very easy to do. And then I'm going to load up all the rest below that, because even if it takes five, six, 10 seconds for that to load the rest of it, they're not consuming all of the content that's in a long format page at once. But now, because I've loaded it all up in 10 seconds and they read the first one or two swipes in the first three to five, as they continue down the page, it gives my site the ability to more, uh, more time to load up the page, which creates a better user experience because now the content is right there, ready to go. They don't have to wait for it to load up if they click on another page or go someplace else. So that's why we see that that design trend happening right now is because it actually helps decrease the likelihood of someone leaving your site quickly. And then the last uh, here is that 38% will stop browsing, literally stop browsing the website, okay, if it's unattractive which means your design, right? If your design is not bad colors, it doesn't appeal to the eye, it's old or outdated, 38% will actively stop browsing, which means they're going to leave your site. So you're losing out on nearly 40% of your leads for sure if they don't have it. And guess where they're going? 
because everyone who put who put a, a, a business in the Q&A here that told me what business they're in, every single one of you has competitors in your space because we all do, right? But every single person right there is going to is going to leave. Uh, you're losing business if you have an outdated site. So focus on that. And again, make sure that your site is linked on social media. If you've got a great site, right? And you're like, okay, I got it all linked on my social media. I went out, I staked my claim, like Bob said, I got, I got all that done. Okay. What's next? Well, this is usually the question. And this is also where most people start to fail in increasing their business. Cause they go out, they build a site, right? They link it on all the social media. And then they're like, well, Bob, why aren't the leads flowing in? And that's simple because at the end of the day, the old adage of if you build it, they will come is no longer true. When it comes to website now, if you build it, nobody cares. There's literally trillions of trillions of sites on Google. Like the last time I looked, it was like thousands of trillions of sites that are indexed by Google. And because there's thousands of trillions of sites being indexed by Google, that means you're competing against thousands of trillions of sites. Even if it's not in your niche, right? And you're competing as a business owner for every dollar in someone's pocket, along with every other business. And you're also competing against basics like food and shelter and things of that nature. So we have to understand that, hey, simply building a website is no good. What we need to do now is we need to capture, nurture, and close folks. Capture, nurture, and close. So again, usually people go capture, nurture, close, right? They understand that, they get it, it makes sense. They go, okay, this all this all makes sense, right? And so they maybe they set up a CRM or maybe they set up some follow-up systems or they got a salesperson or something of that nature, right? But then they're going this, they're going, okay, well, I've got my, my follow-up systems in place, but if you're not actually doing follow-up, it doesn't matter, right? Most people are just still sitting around waiting for people to come in and that's where they're losing out on opportunity. If we spend the time to build a good social presence, we have all of our links pointing back to website. We're doing other marketing out there. Um, the number one thing that I see right now that people are not doing effectively is they're not following up with the leads that they're generating. And again, this might seem very simple, but it's not happening. And how do I know that? Because I am oftentimes looking for services. I want to spend money, like, like shut up and take my money, right? But people aren't giving me that opportunity because they're not following up when it's a good time for me or they're not staying in uh, top of mind or things happen. Like I get busy. I'm like, oh, that's right. I wanted to do that. And I totally forgot about it, you know, for weeks or months on end. Sometimes it can even be. So follow up is super critical. Now, um, I was reading a recent study that said, um, as time goes on, the number of touch points that you have to have is dr increasing dramatically. Even just 10 years ago or so, when I started our first business, which is a little bit more than 10 years ago, right? It took an average of six to seven touch points for someone to, to make a purchasing decision with a business. Six to seven. That was it. Nowadays, it's closer to 14. Now, here's the good part, though. For a lot of people that go, oh, my God, I got to have 14 touch points, Bob. What are you talking about? Like, ain't nobody got time for that, right? That's usually what I hear. Here's the thing, though. Even though it requires more touch points now to convert a lead into a customer, two things are now true. Number one, we have more ability to create more touch points easier than we ever have before. And we have number two is that we have more ability to automate those touch points than we've ever had before, right? So you touch points doesn't necessarily mean that you have to actually be on the phone or participating in the conversation. A lot of times it's just as simple as, as them seeing you. And that could be them seeing you in an ad on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or Google. It could be them getting a text message from you or an email from you. It could be them seeing you at a live event. It could be attending a webinar like this, a training. It could be joining a Facebook group. It could be any number of things. All a touch point really means is your business was in front of them in some capacity at least 14 times, Right. Now, my guess is for most of you right now, you're probably not hitting your average lead 14 times. Follow up is critical. And those touch points make a massive difference in what we're doing. If the answer for you is I'm not doing that, okay, well, I've got great news. There are some easy ways that we can dramatically increase the touch points that take a small investment of time up front in little to no time after that. Right, so I call this the, the follow-up trifecta, and there are three parts to making your um, your touch points increase dramatically. First is we need to implement SMS marketing. 
we need to implement SMS. This means text marketing, okay? Text marketing has a 98% open rate, which is bonkers, right? There's literally nothing else like it right now. Um, and by the way, as time goes on, text marketing will become um, more regulated, which means you will be able to do less of it. But for right now, it's still um, not quite the wild, wild west, but it's not far off, right? Um, so the, the point of this is simply to say, look, we can implement text marketing to increase the number of touch points very quickly because text marketing takes very little time to do. Number two is email. All right, email marketing still works great. We're gonna talk more in detail about that. Now on average, it's only about a 10, 20% open rate. So understand that it's dramatically lower open rates for emails, but that's okay. It's not always about getting folks to open. And by the way, 10 to 20% is the average for cold traffic. If you have a warm audience or someone who knows you, then that should be a significantly higher, right? Like if you have a, a good group of people who knows you, um, for example, we were just working with a client. Um, he has a, a, a small list of like uh, about, about 2000 people that he works with, right? And he gets about a 55% open rate, which is significantly higher, but they know him, right? He has, he has personal connection to most of those uh, few thousand people on his list. But understand that email is not just about open rate. Simply by being in their inbox and them seeing your name, even if they simply delete your email and never read it, they're still looking at you going, oh, great, I saw you, right? So now you're top of mind with them. And then the third part is automation. So if we automate our text and email marketing, we can dramatically increase those touch points very, very quickly. A couple of things about text marketing, and I'm gonna break each of these down for you. And then I'm gonna give you guys some actual sequences that you should have implemented for pretty much every single business, no matter what business you are on here. I'm gonna give you those um, a little bit later in this presentation. So first and foremost, understand that one of the most important things about text marketing is now two-way texting. What I mean by that is that it's important that they can send you a text message and that you can send them one back. Having the ability to communicate back and forth with your potential clients, customers, or even current clients and customers via text is massive. Um, and as time goes on and the millennial and younger generations continue to be our primary buyers, because they kind of already are for most places, right? The baby boomer generation and even Gen X is starting to fall off a little bit. And even if they're not falling off, they are significantly smaller. In fact, the millennial generation is the largest generation in history, right? So which means our buyer pool between millennials and uh, Gen Z is almost double that of boomers and X, right? So if I understand that that's the case, right, I also need to understand that if those are my buyers, what are they doing? How are they operating? What are they wanting? And they want text messaging. They want to understand um, more about how text is being used. And they want to participate via text at a much higher rate than we've seen pretty much anything else in a long time. Here's some crazy facts about text. 91% of consumers would opt in for text messages from brands. Let that sink in for a second. If you are a brand, which all of us, if we're business owners are, and even if you're not a business owner yet, but you're building your personal brand, right? 91% of people would say, yeah, I would be, I'd be down for getting texts. Okay. 58% of consumers believe that SMS is the most effective way of brand communication. 58%. That means over half of people think that it's the best way is for text. Now, don't get me wrong. I understand that there's still going to be, like you said, there's like what, 42% uh, there that still think that maybe phone calls or emails or other things are. That doesn't mean that we ignore those, but we have to understand that this 58% is just from last year. And as time moves forward, that number will continue to increase because the millennial and Gen Z um, generations are, are really driving that stat. And as the buyer, as those buyer pools increase, that percentage is going to increase too. Americans check their phones an average of 47 times a day. That's crazy, 47 times, which means if you're text marketing, you have a much higher chance of them seeing your marketing because it's hitting their phone. Customers find appointment reminders to be the most valuable texts that they receive. So if you are a service-based business and you do any form of appointments, whether it be, um, so for example, uh, uh, Jesse was doing the, yeah, Jesse was doing boat charters, right? So sending them reminders about that, guess what? By Understanding the fact that people want text reminders for appointments, it also enables us to open the door to other text marketing, uh, text for marketing purposes as well, because they won't unsubscribe because they want their appointment reminders. Now, after their appointment's over, right, they may unsubscribe more at a higher rate at that point. But if we've done a good job of building value for them through the appointment process, they'll stay on there through text marketing as uh, uh, post appointment as well. 
And then the average click-through rate for SMS marketing is 19.3% versus about 2% for email. That's insane. Almost 20% of people will click a link that you send to them from a text message marketing. So if you're not using links in your text to get people to your website that we just talked about or to your social profiles or to offers or coupons or specials or sweepstakes or contests or whatever, right? If you're not using that, you're missing out on a massive, massive marketing opportunity. Okay, and here's just some more stats that I found that I thought were really interesting. 34% of people will read a text message within five minutes or less, 26% within one minute and 18, or sorry, 10% within less than 30 seconds. So if we look at that number, what is that? 30, 58, like say almost 70% of people read a text message within five minutes or less. Okay. Within five minutes or less, which means that we can use it for very specific things. So for example, let's say you run an e-commerce store and you want to offer a sale or you run a local business and you say, Hey, for the first 10 people, um, we're doing, you know, a discount or, you know, an add on to your next boat rental, or, Hey, if you message me an insurance, you know, we'll add you to the, the company party next time or whatever. I don't know if that's a thing you do or not, but you get the point, right? The, the idea is simply this. Um, we, we can use their um, need to check text messaging within a short time frame to drive urgency. And by driving urgency, we increase the effectiveness of the marketing. And then the other image here is likelihood of consumers interacting with brands via SMS. If you look at this right here, almost 70% of people said that they are either extremely likely or likely to engage with a brand via text message marketing. So this stuff is working. If you don't have this in your business, all right. You need to implement it. And this is something that we can help companies do. I'm more than happy to help you guys with that as we go along. If you want, just reach out. I'll have my contact information here as well um, for you guys to do that. Okay, so here's an example. Um, this is one of our clients. This is a, a screenshot from Google Analytics. Um, and this is their revenue. I think this was from beginning of July to the end of August. So basically for the last uh, two months. You see those spikes in um, the blue, right? And the blue is revenue. Okay. So those spikes in revenue that, that I highlighted with the uh, yellow arrows, every time we send a text message out for this brand, that's what happens. They get a spike in revenue. If you notice the orange before that, because we just started working with this, this company uh, more recently. Yeah. Yeah. Beginning of June. Yeah. So between June and August, um, I said August 31st, obviously we don't, you know, we're not at August 31st yet. So it's rolling through, you know, today being the 24th. The point is this. Every time we send a text message, we get a spike in revenue. And the reason that I share this image is if we look at this particular company and we look at those numbers, you can see the, the revenue on the left-hand side. Every time we get a spike, it's about 50 to maybe 80 or $90,000 in extra revenue. So if we compare that to what they were doing prior to us coming on board and prior to implementing text marketing, let's just go on the low side and say 50,000 was the average across those five touch points. Well, 50,000 times five, that's an extra $200,000 in revenue for this business, right? $200,000 just from five text messages. That's mind blowing when you think about it. Okay. So understand that using text marketing and offering um, things, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes is super powerful for any brand. Okay. So next email marketing. Now, let's talk about email marketing in detail. I know a lot of people think that email marketing has died off. And well, that simply isn't true. Um, in fact, COVID revitalized email marketing. And this is a really crazy thing to, to be talking about right now, but it's true. So from, uh, I first started email marketing uh, like effectively and really doing it in about 2011, right? So it's been, what is that? 11 years I've been doing email marketing. And in 2011 until 2016 or so, the number increased from about $15 ROI all the way up to about 50, I think 56 or 58 was the highest they ever got, right? And then about 2016 or so, it started going back down. And in 2019, it hit a new low point, which I think was like $35. Now, let me let that sink in for a second. In 2019, you would still make $35 for every $1 spent on email marketing. Okay. Then COVID hit. People can't go out. Shops closed down. So what do they do? 
they go online. They start buying online. They start shopping online. They start signing up for more email lists. That's how they get notified about what's going on because they're not walking by their favorite store anymore to see the sales or whatever's happening or the latest and greatest merchandise that came in from wherever. It continued to go up. In fact, in 2021, it bounced back up from like, I think it was, it was like $32 or $33 or maybe $34, somewhere around there, right? It bounced back up from 2019 to 2021 to $46. So in 2021, the average ROI for $1 spent on email marketing was $46. Remember I said, I was gonna show you how you get a 46X ROI. This is it. Just do email marketing. Now, here's the thing. The reason that this number is true is because email marketing as a whole is extremely inexpensive to execute, right? Like even with our CRM that we have, if you wanted to send 10,000 emails, it's going to cost you like, I think, less than $100 to send 10,000, uh, 10, actually, I think it's less than $10 to send like 10,000 emails. And the point of that is this, email has mass adaptation, mass appeal, allows for mass marketing for a very low spend. In fact, the highest amount of money that you'll have to spend on email marketing is the time to actually write good emails that speak to your audience, okay? But for most of us, we can find the time to do that. And here's the thing. The other great part about email marketing is that once an email is written, particularly in things like sequences that are ongoing, now it's done, right? Literally, I get to use that email forever. So once it's built, I can replicate it over and over and over and over and over again. Okay. So how do we use email marketing to our best advantage? A couple of things that we can do. Um, first and foremost, um, welcome emails have the highest potential. They are also the number one most wasted email, in my opinion, from what I've seen when we take over marketing for companies. Okay. So the welcome email has an average open rate of 82% versus 21% in this case being the average for non-opening, uh, non-welcome uh, emails. So what does that mean for us? Well, for most of us, we use the welcome email to say, Hey, welcome aboard. Thanks for joining our list. We appreciate you being part of our community, right? We just give some generic information, but the reality is if they're opting in for a brand email, they know you have something to sell and they're totally okay being sold to right? They're totally okay buying things from you. Otherwise, they wouldn't have opted in to your email in the first place. So one of the biggest mistakes I see business owners make is they don't use that welcome email as a chance to either sell something or upsell something to someone. When we have a massive open rate like that, we're leaving money on the table by not having that be the case. So I would always, particularly if the first email that they get is a purchase, um, completed purchase email, you should absolutely be offering them something else to buy. In fact, go look at Amazon, right? Every time you get a buying email, like a, a, a purchase confirmation email from Amazon, almost always they include, hey, you know, do you want to add this to your order? If you add this in the next, you know, uh, two hours and 46 minutes, you'll, you know, you can get it in the same box in the same day or, or whatever. Right. But the reason for that is, is because it works. It works insanely effectively and people understand how business works and they're okay with it. As long as you're not being like super hardcore, aggressive and annoying about it. Right. But include offers or upsells in your initial email. You'll see a dramatic uptick in your sales. Um, next, interactive emails are really going to be the best way forward. So what we're seeing in the last two years is that if you simply just send text emails with no interactivity, you're not going to get nearly as much click through. And by adding a video to your email, you can increase the click rates by over 300%. So when I say include a video in your email, obviously in most cases, we can't actually put the video in the email itself, right? It doesn't allow the email marketing, especially does not allow for that functionality, at least at this point in time. So what does that mean? That means host the video on YouTube or Vimeo or your website or allow them to click through to the site to do that. Now, um, here's a pro tip, write this down. If you're going to use video in your email marketing, I highly, highly, highly recommend that you embed the video into your website. And then you, when they click the link from your email to go view the video, even if the video is being hosted on YouTube or some other place like that, having them view it from your website enables a couple of things to happen. Number one, now you get the click tracking to your site. Number two, your site gets credit for the traffic, which improves your SEO. And number three, and probably most important, if you've got the proper paid advertising pixels like Facebook pixel, Google pixel, TikTok pixel, all those on your site, 
you are now feeding data for customers who are interested in a particular service or offering that you have, which you can then use to market to them or remarket to them and drive your overall ad costs down. Okay. So this is a great way to do that. Hopefully all that made sense. But look, email marketing is not dead, right? It's totally um, still one of the greatest ways to stay in communication. And I want to share with you guys two of our client examples. Um, uh, the one on the left right here, this is actually a brand that we manage and we only do email marketing. We literally don't do anything else. We, we basically just collect uh, emails for people and we send out emails and look, it's doing $1.7 million. This was, I think March, right? Yeah. March 1st to 31st, um, 1.7 million, 8,400 orders just from email marketing. Now that list is probably almost Mm, about 80,000, maybe 90,000 people or something like that, right? So it's a small percentage of the list that's buying. But the point is, because we can do this at mass scale, it can be a giant revenue generator if we do it the right way. And then the one on the right, um, actually that yellow line is where we took over. And that's where we started implementing email. And actually the big spike that you see in just to the right of the arrow, right? That big spike is from some text marketing as well. But you notice the difference between when we started and before. Not that they weren't getting sales before, but by implementing successful email campaigns and successful text marketing, we are driving up the actual uh, average order values. And by the way, I took that screenshot just today, um, just to give them the most recent stats. So email is not dead. Implement it in your business. Use it effectively. Um, usually the number one question I get from everyone is, okay, Bob, well, how often should I be emailing someone? And the answer to that is it depends. But usually at least twice a week is a good starting point. If you get people that start unsubscribing saying, no, you're too annoying. I want to be gone, right? You can roll it back. If they're not, if you're not getting those and you can increase it until you start to get that feedback, um, because at the end of the day, um, if you're not um, pissing off at least a couple of people, you're probably not being aggressive enough with your emails. And again, remember, you're probably going to have 20, maybe 30% um, open rate of your emails. So for every thousand, you know, only 200 to 300 are going to see the actual content of the email. And so that means a couple of things. Number one, it means that we need to have a larger list. Number two, understand that even if they're not opening it, they're still seeing it in their inbox, right? And so maybe they go, oh, that's right. I did want to buy, you know, X, Y, Z from that company, right? And I keep seeing your emails and it reminds me to go back and do that. Or, oh, hey, I wanted, you know, another repeat order or whatever, right? Just seeing your name there increases it. It's kind of like Coca-Cola, right? When we think about Coca-Cola, when was the last time you saw an ad from Coca-Cola that said, go buy Coca-Cola because, you know, it's awesome. They don't really do that kind of advertising anymore because they know, you know, Coke exists. So instead of marketing to you saying, go do this, like a direct response, like, Hey, you know, buy one, get one free of Coke using this code online or whatever. Right. They're marketing, just saying, Hey, don't you want a Coke? They're marketing as brand recognition to let you know why, because they already are known out there. They just want to be top of mind so that when you think you're thirsty, you're thinking of them. And so your marketing and email can kind of do the same thing. Whenever they want your service or they're thinking about your service, you want you to be the first person that they think of or first company that they think of. So next is going to be automation. Automation is what you need. So if you want to increase to those four, uh, 14 plus touch points, which most everyone, actually I think everyone in here said no, that they weren't doing at least 14 touch points with a cust uh, potential customer, is to implement automation. So that means having sequences of information for folks so that they can drive in and um, you can automate those touch points as much as possible. Okay. Um, Jesse asked a great question. So what's the best way to get a hold of an email list for people who are not past clients? Um, Jesse, hang with me for a second. I'm going to talk about that here in a few minutes. And I think it'll, it'll help you uh, clarify that. If I don't, for some reason, make sure you just send another message in. I'll be happy to answer that. But yeah, um, automation is how we're going to make this happen. Look, the reality is for most of us as entrepreneurs, we don't have time to be doing 14 touch points manually with every single potential client, because we know that the majority of our, our potentials are not going to actually be business. So we need to automate it. We need to put something in. And there are some do's and don'ts when it comes to automation. Um, obviously, the best way to do this is to use a CRM, um, something that our company has, and we can offer and plug into pretty much any business. So if you want that, let me know. Um, if you've already got one, great. Then let's talk about the do's and don'ts. If you don't have one at all, definitely something to consider implementing. But there are some do's and don'ts with automation. Let's walk through them. First and foremost, you want to automate follow-up on a consistent basis. 
This could be things like newsletter appointment reminders, check-ins. It could be new offerings. Um, for example, uh, Jesse, I know you do you do boat rent rentals, right? So let's say someone cancels a boat, right? And you now have it available and you want to put it back out there. Or it could be, for example, um, you know, let's say I get a new boat, right? I want to let everyone know that there's a new cool wakeboard boat that I got that comes with this, right? And I want to do that. Perfect, right? Um, if you are... Uh, who was it? Uh, Campbell, you're doing insurance sales, right? So maybe there's some new insurance product that's going to help them, or you offer some new bundling discount, or, uh, you know, I mean, look, Progressive made an entire commercial series that's been one of the most effective ever just on the word bundling, right? So play to what works. Understand that, hey, that's the, the case. Um, let's see, um, uh, Morgan, you said you have a, a virtual health and wellness. Perfect. So when it comes to health and wellness right now, there's always new information coming out. There's new um, options for things that people don't even know about. I was just reading about uh, or listening to something about, it might have been on a Joe Rogan podcast about like Ashkawanda or something like that. And I could be totally butchering the word. So if I am, you know, forgive me. Um, but like, I was like, wow, that's really cool. I didn't know it could do um, all that stuff. So, uh, you know, and, but I learned about it, but things like that are important. Um, Stuart, great question. He asked, what is a CRM? That means customer relationship management. Um, what that really means is like an email marketing program, customer marketing program, something that allows you to store all of the people that you're going to be marketing to and communicate with them on a consistent basis, right? Um, so those kinds of things, automate that kind of follow-up on a consistent basis. Next is automate actions for users whenever possible. So what do I mean by that? Well, a great email marketing CRM or text marketing program will allow you to automate when something happens. So for example, one of the ways that I do this, and this is really, this is a, a slick way to make something happen. Let's say that I have a new service offering, a new product, a new line, a new whatever, right? That I'm, I want to get in people's hands and let them know about that this is a thing that they can do, okay? Um, in our CRM, what I'll do is I create what's called a trigger link. And a trigger link will execute certain things. It triggers other actions when the link is clicked. So what I do is I include in my text marketing or my email marketing, this trigger link. When they click on, they being the customer or potential customer clicks on the link, it automatically executes another series of actions. So for example, let's just say I've got a new product or service line and they click the trigger link, right? Well, automatically it actually um, creates a notification in my system for my sales team to reach out to that person and say, hey, I saw that you were interested in XYZ service or offering or product or whatever. Um, did you have more questions that I could answer for you about that? Because I know that they clicked on it so they have a higher level of interest in the average person. And by having that automated action triggering to say, someone needs to call this person and follow up with them, it allows for me to do this. Um, and by the way, we do this in real estate too. Like, let's say I've got a new deal that I need funded, right? I do the same concept. Everyone who clicks in the link, I'm picking up the phone going, hey, I saw you clicked in the link. Was there some questions about the deal that you had that didn't get answered, right? And I always, by the way, I always raise it like, is there questions that you have that didn't get answered or something you, you wanted to know more about or, you, you know, whatever? Because generally speaking, no matter how good our marketing is on our websites or our offerings, anything like that, people still have questions. And so if I open the door for them to ask more questions, I can start to pinpoint what is the holdup for them taking action. I can address that objection and then close them on the deal later on. Okay. So this is an awesome way to make that happen. All right. Keep it brief. So text messages, write this down. You have no more than 160 characters. 160 characters is all you get for a single text message. If it goes to more than 160, it's going to break it into two different text messages. Um, it's just the way it works with text marketing right now because not um, that's how SMS was designed. Okay, so keep it brief. Um, I try to do all my messages in less than 160 characters. Uh, pro tip for this. Microsoft Word, and I think Google Sheets might, or not Sheets, but Google uh, Docs might do this as well. But in Microsoft Word, if you type out the text message and then you select the whole thing, like highlight it, in the bottom left corner, there's a thing that says word count. If you click the word count, it'll actually give you a character count with spaces. That will tell you how many characters your, yours is. So that way you can make it sure it's less than 160. If you're doing an email, I keep all of my emails at 250 words or less. What that basically means is on my phone, it's going to be two scrolls. So like one, two. Because if it's anything more than that, they're just, they're, they're going to check out, right? And then people aren't going to read a novel on their phone from your email. So keep it brief to the point. If you have more to say, if you need more space, put it on a web page or a landing page or some sort of marketing material that they can then click to, to get more details and learn more from there. That's fine. But don't do it in your marketing, right? Keep your marketing brief and simple. 
personalize it whenever possible. This means using merge fields like, hey, you know, bracket, first name, bracket. So instead of bracket, first name says, hey, Bob, hey, Chris, hey, Andrew, hey, Stuart, hey, Jesse, right? People know that, you know, it's automated that way, but trust me, it still works. It makes people feel good when they see their name in there uh, all the time. Okay. And other things too, other data points you can merge in, right? Include a clear call to action. If your email is going to have any form of call to action, then absolutely don't make it confusing. Like, hey, if you wanted to, you know, you could maybe kind of click the thing at the bottom, you know, but you know, if you don't want to, it's okay. Like, no, just be like, if you want this, click here. If you want this thing, do this, click this button, go to this website, call this phone number, whatever your call to action is fine. Keep one, one singular call to action, right? So don't have a link to more details and then also a button to go by. Just one, either more details or go by, um, or, you know, one call is just like, get more details and buy, right? That's fine too. But because it's only one, when I say one call, that's just like one button, one link, one place to go. If we start putting in, in marketing emails, at least, right? Obviously like, you know, other like customer service emails, we can do more than one link or more than one call to action because sometimes we need to, but for marketing, keep it straightforward, simple to the point. Now also make it easy to exit. What do I mean by this? Especially with email marketing, it is a mistake to keep people in your system and continue to market to them if they never do anything or they don't want to be a part of your marketing anymore, right? So technically by law for email marketing and text marketing, if we don't offer a way to unsubscribe and stop getting that communication, we are in violation of the Can Spam Act. Now, look, they're not going to come arrest you and drag you off to jail for it, right? But they could issue a fine because they've done that before if you, if you do it too often. So most good programs, CRMs or email marketing programs will offer a way to do that. Ours, for example, in every email has a thing at the bottom that says unsubscribe for all emails. And for texts, if you say stop or unsubscribe, it automatically processes that as, hey, I don't want to get marketing anymore. And so they can unsubscribe that way, right? But just make it easy. Don't make it complex. for If they don't want to be a part of your marketing, if they haven't risen their hand, they're like, I'm done, I'm out, then don't market to them because they're not going to buy from you anyways. So there's no point in keeping them in your marketing if you don't. Some don'ts. Don't do these things. Don't use images. Um, in your marketing. Now, I know this sounds crazy and there is some exceptions. I will, uh, I will go through this in a second. When it comes to marketing, particularly via emails, the more images that you include into your uh, email, the more spam, uh, spammy it's considered by most email providers, um, which means you have a higher chance of going in a spam folder and not being seen at all. So even though you did all this effort to make your email look super pretty, at the end of the day, most folks are just loading it up on their phone. They don't want to have to scroll five times through all your images to see things. Now, the exception to this is for e-commerce stores that are offering products. If you're an e-commerce store and you're offering a product, sometimes you're going to want to see those things, you know, but include one or two. You don't get, don't get crazy, right? Like the only people that can include tons of images and it works are like super well established brands. So like if you're, you know, J Crew or Express or you know, Pack Sun or one of those, right? Sure, you can include a bunch of photos because you know what? Like people know who you are, they know what the brand is, right? But when we're smaller companies and we're not as well known. Don't include a ton of images, one or two, that's about it. And by the way, if you're guilty of putting your logo at the top of your emails, I've actually started moving my logo to the bottom because nobody cares about my logo. They're going to scroll right past it on the phone anyways um, and go from there. And then the last thing for not using images is this. A lot of people on their phone have their phones in dark mode and some have their phones in light mode. And unfortunately, email at this time is not yet smart enough to find that setting and adjust the content to match the mode that they're in. And so if we start using a lot of images, sometimes it can look really bad on one or the other. And if that happens, it decreases our credibility, which is no good for us. So keep it simple. I use literally almost no images unless absolutely necessary. Just stick to text, call it a day, and then I point them to my site to get more details from there. Okay. Don't use misleading subject lines right? Look, clickbaity things are okay to a certain extent, but like I had a guy one time send an email. It was like, why I had to kill my dad. And I was like, whoa, what? Right. And then I opened the email and it has absolutely nothing to do with that. Like literally nothing at all. He's just trying to get people to open it and look, it worked, but I also unsubscribed immediately because I was like, well, this is absurd, right? I don't mind a good headline getting my attention and making me open it, but make sure that the email matches the headline. Like, the, you know, follow through that story. Make sure that that story makes sense or that headline makes sense with the email, right? Don't just write random things because, you know, you heard it works well. Okay, never publish your emails without testing. So what do I mean by that? In most of these email marketing and CRM systems, the best thing that we can do is actually test what we're doing. So we're gonna go in, we're going to 
run a test to ourselves at the very least, make sure, does it come in? How does it look on my phone? Does it write? Does the button go to the right place? Is it all the formatting the right way? All that. So don't just send out emails because you can always test them. Make sure they look good before, especially before you publish them in your system. Don't automate personal touches. And what I mean by this is, right. It's very difficult for me to say, Oh, um, Hey Jesse, it was so great to, you know, meet you, you know, at, you know, at the lake for a day of fun and sun, right? Like personalized things like that. We can't really automate that, right? It's very, and if I try to include, you know, tags and fields to make that happen, it becomes very difficult and almost always ends up failing, right? So personalized things like that, we're not going to automate. What we do want to automate, and we can, we can still personalize our content with like first names and data points that make sense. But I'm never going to reach out and say, hey, man, it was so great to meet up with you um, to talk about that private money deal. Um, I really look forward to working with you in the future. I hope your wife's good. Like, I'm not going to automate that kind of personal uh, level of touch because it just it doesn't work very well. And even if I could, there's a higher chance of it bouncing back and not um, it uh, actually, you know, backfiring on me. Don't forget to clean your data. So I talked a little bit about this before, but um, if people don't want to be part of your marketing, all right, if they're actually saying, hey, I want to unsubscribe, let them go. They weren't going to buy anything from you anyways. And then if people are not engaging with your marketing, it's actually best to remove them, particularly when it comes to email. Most email providers will actually um, penalize you for sending too many emails with a low open rate. So what I mean by that is, let's say you have 100,000 people on your list. You send out 100,000 emails to every person, you know, you send one email to all of them, so 100,000 emails. And only a thousand people actually open the email. The other 999,900, 900, whatever, or whatever that is. I can't do math good. Um, don't. Well, Google and Microsoft and Yahoo and all these guys are saying, okay, well, you send out 100,000 emails into our server and only 500 of them got opened. That means you're a low quality sender. So they start to mark your content as spam and then it doesn't get seen by anybody. So you're actually better to remove people from marketing who have not engaged with you in over 30 days. So if in 30 days, right, you're sending out at least twice a week or more within 30 days, if they don't open a single email or respond to something or click something or anything, all right, then you might want to move those folks into a long-term nurture campaign, or maybe I only message them instead of twice a week, once a month, once every other month, something like that, right? Because I don't want to have too many emails going out that people aren't opening. It reduces my quality score down with every email provider. Don't skip A-B testing. Most programs will allow you to send an email and say, hey, I want to send to 500 people email with subject line A and other, a different 500 people an email with subject line B, right? Whichever one gets the highest open rate, I can then say, okay, great. That one, B got better than A. So I'm going to send B to the other 10,000 people in my email list or whatever you have. So that's an important way to, to make that happen as well. Just test that. Make sure you know what's working best. Okay. And then don't forget to segment, folks. Most great CRMs and systems will allow you to tag or identify people as who they are. So what I mean by that is like Jesse in the boat space, right? So I might have, you know, people who rented boat A, boat B, boat C, boat D, right? Like I'm going to break them all out in the insurance space. Okay. These are homeowners insurance. These are renters insurance. This is car insurance, you know? And so what you don't want to happen is I send marketing messages to someone who already has a service with me, because if I tell them, Hey, you already have service A, but don't you want to buy service A? It makes me look bad. And they're like more likely to unsubscribe because there's a lot of value there because they already have that service. So we want to segment folks to make sure that we can know who's doing what, who's got what, who's in where, and what's happening with them to make sure things are going along. I have follow-up sequences for several different businesses in here. So if yours is not here right in a second, hang tight. I'm going to go through this. And Jesse, I'll get to yours here in a second. So if um, I know a lot of you are real estate investors, I know Chris said a lot had a lot of people had real estate investors. So I included more. And I, I, honestly, as an investors, a lot of you guys go through a lot more people. You should be marketing to email marketing to and tech marketing to private money lenders, such as documents they need, deals you need money for, deals that they missed, interest that they've paid, that you paid out, um, daily happenings. Um, and this should be long forever, right? A lot of people are going to continue to get emails, even if it's on a less frequent basis, but they're never going to get removed from my list unless they unsubscribe. Um, for investors with sellers, right? Why you're trustworthy, how it works, the benefits, contact information, right? And then usually I break this into short and long-term. Short is less than 30 days. Long-term is greater than 30 days. Usually I hammer them harder in the, um, the, the first 30 days and then less so on the longer 30 days, right? And then if you're an agent or you're working with agents, show them how you're going to save them time or not have them waste money. What's their money per transaction? What do you do for them? Um, why they should care? And this, again, should be a long one. They should never be removed from your list. 
Investor buyers, uh, if you have great deals, great rentals, opportunities, email those folks for contractors, you know, what money, uh, how they're going to make money with you, what the scope of works that you don't do changes, things like that. Right now, this last one here is for affiliate services. If you're a real estate investor or you're any other business, there's a high probability that you can incorporate affiliate services into your marketing, particularly for customers who've already bought something from you. And what do I mean by this? So um, if you've ever gotten an email from your bank, for example, with an offer to buy insurance, well, that's an affiliate offer. And what that does is if you go in and you buy insurance from that company that your bank emailed you about, right? The bank gets paid a portion of the premium that you're paying or whatever service or policy or a flat fee. They're getting some sort of kickback for doing that. Um, and so Jesse, you, uh, one of the questions you asked me was, what's the best way to get a hold of an email list for people who are not past clients? Um, and Jesse, affiliate services can be one of the best ways to do that. So what do I mean by that? So you're going to go out there and you're going to find, um, and Jesse, uh, since you do boat rentals in Lake Travis, um, I'm going to give you a very specific example. I would go out to every single local business that operates in Lake Travis, right? So, you know, every, every local business. So, you know, hit up the, the Mediterranean spot there on the corner, hit up the, you know, Sundancer, hit up the, every restaurant, hit up all the barber shops that are there. Uh, all of these places are going to have email lists in most cases, right? They'll have some, at least some customers if they're, you know, halfway decent at their business. And you're going to say, Hey, look, would you be open to setting up an affiliate agreement whereby you email your email list about my services, about what I offer in exchange for a percentage of the revenue generated? Okay. Or it could be, you know, I'm going to pay you a flat fee for, you know, marketing their emails and what you do and for everyone, by the way, even if you're not Jesse in the boat rental space in Lake Travis, Austin, right. No matter what business you're in, right. Find people who have your customers and have them email on your behalf. So for example, this webinar is the same thing, right? Let's, I want to be transparent with you, right? Chris is a friend of mine, good friend of mine. And when I was in Buffalo the other week, we sat down and he said, actually, I can't do the webinar this Wednesday because we're at an event. Would you be open to doing it for all of you people? And if any of you guys decide that you want to work with my company, he's going to get a small piece of the service fee, right? As an affiliate for this. So he makes a little bit of money. I make a little bit of money. I get to help you guys. You guys win and get more business. So everyone's winning all over the place right? This is how I would build an email list if I, uh, with, of people that that's the, the, in my opinion, probably the, the, the biggest way. The other way around this too, is that if you've already got an email list, you could go out to all the businesses that have, um, um, that need your customers and either a offer to say, Hey, can I send an email about your service to my list and get paid an affiliate fee? Or are you willing to pay X number of dollars to, uh, for me to email on your behalf to my list? Now, this is an important thing. Write this down. If you're going to do an email marketing around affiliate, whether it be you um, going to another business and having them market for you, or if you're going to uh, allow other businesses to market on your list, understand a couple of things. Whoever owns the list should always be doing the emailing or text marketing. Don't ever sell or buy an email list from somebody else. They don't know who you are. There's no trust there. If you utilize the current list owner to send the message instead of you, you piggyback on their credibility as someone that that customer already knows and is engaging with and participating in marketing for, right? So you increase your credibility, which means you're going to increase the effectiveness of what that is over just emailing or getting that list and emailing them yourself, okay? Uh, number two, technically speaking, if you email to people more than once who have not opted in, the first email has to be the uh, the option to opt in for marketing. Um, otherwise, you're technically in violation of the Can Spam Act. Now, it's a fine line. It's kind of a dark gray area. It can be done. No one's going to really come after you for it, right? As long as you don't do it too crazy. Um, but the reality is, if you're going to someone else's email list, have them email on your behalf because you're going to get significantly better results by doing it this way. If you have an email list, or if you're following my instructions and you start building one from this webinar moving forward, right? Right. In your emails, how can you help them with affiliate services? You know, do they need, in this case, I put a bunch of real estate in here, but you know, sellers, lenders, investors, contractors, or agents, they know, but who else do they need to know? Right. So like, um, uh, Jesse, you, you do boat rentals, right. And in the Austin area, well, people who are going to pay the money to, to rent a boat, 
they're not broke folks, right? Like they're, they're going to have a little bit more, uh, you know, spare cash to spend on something of that nature, which means maybe I go to, um, there's that sushi place right there by, by HEB. That's like kind of really good and, and sort of high end. So maybe I work out a deal with them because well, people who go on a boat might be more likely to want sushi. And maybe I can work out a deal that way. Right. If you're in the, um, the health and wellness space, right? The virtual health and wellness space. Okay, there's tons of you know organic greens and supplements that you can become an affiliate uh, provider for and put those those things in front of your audience to get paid from those service providers for that. Or go out and find companies that have those lists and offer to do it. Um, same thing with influencers, right? You can head to Instagram or TikTok, find someone who's in your space who does things like that and plug them in. So like. I know in, and by the way, I know I'm, I'm, I'm kind of picking on Jesse here, but just because I was there, but there's a guy in, in Austin. He does, uh, it's, I think it's called libation junkie, if I remember correct. Right. And he's like a high end bartender. Well, that might be something for you, Jesse, to go and say, Hey, let me get this guy. We're going to do, you know, a pontoon boat with the, the, this high end bartender who's going to mix great cocktails out on the lake for the day or, or something. Right. I, I don't know. Like, but I'm just kind of spitballing here, but you kind of get the idea, right? If I'm doing insurance, right. How can I wrap into other things that are going on? Like what other people have my clients? Okay. Well, a lot of times that could be agents, right? Just bought a new house. I need to get homeowners insurance. I might need new car insurance. Maybe I'm moving and I want to change my insurance provider, right? Like that's a great opportunity. So connect with all your local real estate agents and become the go-to insurance guy for every agent in your area. So these are just ideas for affiliate services. And then when we plug in text and email marketing for these, we either A, increase our own list or B, increase our revenue opportunities. Um, next, e-commerce. E, uh, e you should be absolutely sending out things like abandoned cart emails and text. Browse. Uh, they were browsing. I was looking at a product, but I left. Um, you know, they should be doing a customer win back, which means, hey, you bought something, but you haven't bought anything in a while. And I want you to come back. Um, it could be new customer. Thank you. Like, by the way, this is not just about marketing to them about buying your, your services. It could also be about buying more of your services or buying more of your products or buying more of whatever you have to offer. Okay. Um, products review, product reviews and cross sales. Amazon is the king of this stuff. They do that. Great. Um, repeat customer. Thank yous. That's always a great way as well. Um, always include a welcome series. And by the way, I put this in e-commerce, but really it's true for anyone, any customer who comes on board, they should always have a welcome series, you know, welcoming them aboard, thanking them for being a part of your, your business, um, telling them what to accept, uh, expect, setting those expectations and, and walking them through, you know, what they need to do. Right. If there's a, a location involved in an appointment. Hey, by the way, this is how you get here. Here's the address in case you need it. You know, here's our recommendations. If you're coming from the north, go this way. From the south, go that way. You know, things like that. Um, you should always have a post-purchase series, even if you're not in e-commerce. If they buy something from you, there should be a sequence of emails to A, make sure that they're happy. B, request a review if they are happy from your Google page or uh, on your store, if you're doing a store or something of that nature. And C, at the very least, you should be offering them more services because if they bought from you once, they're likely to buy from you again. Um, and then again, affiliate offers and any sort of company news. Okay, for service-based businesses, always be sharing wins or testimonials, right? So if someone had a great time on the lake, I'm going to share about it, right? They made an awesome video, perfect. I'm going to use that and let people know what's going on. Um, someone had insurance and then a tree fell and hit their car, but they didn't have to worry because they had a great insurance from you, perfect. Talk about that. You're in the health and wellness space, perfect. Talk about how someone had chronic pain in the wrists from arthritis and you know you helped them with a supplement regimen and now all of a sudden your inflammation's way down and all of a sudden they feel better. They can, you know, they can squeeze scissors again to cut the, you know, whatever. I don't know. I'm just, again, spitballing here, but you kind of get the idea. Show examples of work, things that you've done, how, um, you know, if, if, again, if you're like a, like we run a digital agency, right? So I, like I shared in this case, screenshots of things that we've done for other clients to show you that, Hey, I'm legitimate. I've done this before. I'm not brand new. I have experience and I can prove it to you. Okay. Um, you should always request referrals, right? If someone bought something from you, they always know someone who's going to buy from you as well. So request that referral. Um, in some cases, you can even offer them an affiliate commission if they come on board, right? So that's an, also an opportunity, right? You should always be getting uh, asking for Google reviews, especially if you're a service-based business or for your local business. Um, you should be offering values and tips around your service, doing resources, checklists, guides. People love those, especially right now, guys, with holidays coming up, right? Gift guides. 
getting yourself in gift guides is a huge way to drive a lot of business right now and gather a lot of uh, emails from people and say, Hey, you know, if you saw, you know, if you saw my service in XYZ magazine, use, you know, the code XYZ magazine 10 to get 10% off your, you know, your first service or whatever, uh, check-ins. So when I mean check-ins like, Hey, like, you know, you bought this, how's it going? Everything been good. You know, how do you feel? Are you ready for your next time or next service or next, whatever you offer? Um, onboarding series, kind of same as the welcome series. Again, post-purchase, same as everybody. And then company news too, obviously. And then if you're a local business, okay, uh, any sort of flash sales or special offers, this is particularly great if you have excess inventory that you need to get rid of. And this is especially great for text marketing because you can say, hey, today only in shop, we're going to offer 15% off, you know, XYZ thing that you need to get rid of because you've got too much of it in stock or, or whatever. Loyalty programs. This is a great one. And by the way, this is good for even service-based businesses or even e-commerce stores. Can you offer some sort of loyalty program that helps them understand that they get rewards in some capacity? Look, Every major business that you participate in probably has a loyalty program of some sort. Like Chipotle has one and um, like almost every restaurant has one, right? I mean, shoot, even, uh, even Amazon has a loyalty program. And the fact that if you sign up for their Amazon store card, you get 5% cash back on every purchase that you make on Amazon. Right. So it's essentially it's incentivizing loyalty to buy on Amazon versus someplace else. Uh, any sort of contest or sweepstakes. Again, by the way, I, I, I tried to organize these based on where, you know, I felt they would be best placed, but some of these cross over into other places. But email, let people know you got contests or sweepstakes happening, especially as holidays come up. That's a huge one, too. Any sort of new offerings, partnerships and affiliates, again, company news, any local area happenings. This is particularly one for local businesses. So as we go into um, fall, there's always in most local areas like, you know, the the pumpkin festival or the, you know, um, we, we have apple, uh, apple bobbing in, in the Buffalo market is a huge one, right? So like that's, you talk about, talk about all the things that, you know, there, is there, uh, in Austin, you have in October, you've got what F1 and you've got, um, how was it? A ACL live, the, the big, uh, concert series that happens on there at Zilker. Um, you've got a ton of stuff that happened, right? Like, so talk about those things. If you're a local based business and let people got no, because they may not know these things are happening, right? Obviously if it's a huge thing, they might know, but you know, if there's like something happening in Lakeway specifically, like talk about that because then people understand, Oh, like, look, that's cool. Now I know about it. I'm more likely to stay on your marketing because I, I know you're talking about things, not just marketing. And then of course, any sort of exclusive events or offerings, things of that nature can be very helpful as well. By the way, this is my information. If I can help you with a website, CRM, or any form of digital marketing, please just reach out. You can email me. Um, I would appreciate if you mentioned that you saw me on Chris Noggle's Wealth Webinar Wednesday, um, as I was talking about before, and transparency, right? He gets an affiliate cut for this because why? We all want to win, right? I'm happy to pay full price for any of my friends' businesses if it helps them win because it helps me too. If there's any specific questions, go ahead and drop those questions in the question box and I will do my best to answer them. Oh, perfect. Okay, so someone asked, um, should I be buying email lists or not? Um, and that's a great question. And I talked briefly about this, but um, buying email lists um, is a fine line. Like I said before, you're always, always going to be better to get someone to market on your behalf than actually buy the emails for yourself. And this is simply because it allows for you um, to transfer their credibility from, um, from them to you. Um, so uh, I would always, uh, always do that in this case. I think that's going to be a much more effective, um, effective way around um, getting everyone that you need to. But again, guys, if there's anything I can do for you, please reach out. Hopefully you found some value. If you did, I, if you could just put a one, if you found some value, you learned some things on how to do, uh, let me know. If you thought I sucked for some reason, cool, then tell me why I sucked. So I can always always work on improving. I, I take all feedback, good, bad, negative, neutral, anything in between. Good, uh, good move on the 360 degree feedback there going on. Awesome. But so amazing information today, Bob, as always, um, you are just always a wealth of knowledge as far as marketing um, and uh, putting it in a way that is really down to earth and kind of things that we can use. So I really do appreciate it, man. Thank you so much for kind of pitch hitting for us today. Really appreciate it. If you folks, again, if you have any questions, feel free, Bob at go3dc.com. Um, reach out to him again. Just make sure that you know, or that uh, you mention in your email that uh, you are, uh, that you were referred through this, uh, through the Wealth Wednesday webinar, uh, just so we make sure we have that in our records. Anyway, good to see you again, Bob. And uh, hey, have a uh, great Andrew, actually, someone Wednesday. asked real quick, um, oh, where, yeah, sure. is, there a, is there a replay of this webinar? I, I mean, it's being recorded, yes. so I assume there is. Where there do will they find be. that? 
Yep. As soon as it, once you're done, once we're done with this, once we actually get the replay uh, processed, we're going to send it off. Um, usually get an email shortly after that. So yes, there will be a replay. Everyone else who, who dropped in, I appreciate you guys being on. And again, if I can help you in any way, just reach out. Just let me know where you found me so that I know. And uh, we'll go from there. Awesome, bud. Perfect. Have a great rest of your Wednesday, folks. So I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. We're putting up tons of them, but I think if you like this one, you'll probably like that video as well. Not only that, I've got a book that I created, Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery, where we actually show you what the wealthy do in the game they play with money. I want you to have that for free. And if you wanna know about all my new videos coming up, click that alert button, actually smash that alert button, and you'll be notified every time we put a new video. So we'll see you on the next episode.